Welcome, everybody, to the main event today. We have a real special guest. His name is Richard Torrey. Like many, at the age of four, Rich started doodling with a pencil and a sketch pad. But unlike most, he parlayed that love for illustrations and storytelling into an award-winning career as a syndicated cartoonist, a children's book author, and an illustrator. Along the way, he was introduced to the great Charles Schultz, he was the creator of the, the legendary strip Peanuts, of course. He, Rich has provided illustrations for Disney, King Features, and The National. Plus, he's had the good fortune to even drink from the Stanley Cup. So welcome this morning, Richard Torrey. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. That's, that's quite a, a resume that we've talked about. <laughs> uh, and we're going to go into some of the details, Rich, as, as we go through our presentation today. All right. Yeah, so, sort of a strange combination. It, it, it is the, probably the most unique combination of any artist or illustrator that <laughs> is walking on the planet. So <laughs> I will give you that. So one of the things that I know that a, a lot of the young people are interested in talking about is, you know, you've authored and illustrated more than 15 children's books. And what, what would be really interesting to start with is what's your creative process like? Does the story come first or are the illustrations there first? How do you work? Well, it's the best way to describe it is sort of controlled chaos. Um, I, the, the very first book I ever did, Beans Baker number five, I did it the traditional way. I came up with an idea and I just started writing, started typing on the computer and I spent three months doing it and it worked, but it, it really wasn't fun for me. Like I, it, it was not, it, it felt foreign to me. Um, what I have ended up coming up with is a, is this sort of strange system that has worked for me. And so there's no story that comes to me fully formed. And, and oftentimes not even a story comes to me but sort of a little spark or like, ooh, that might make a good story. The story's not there, but the character is or a little part of the story. And so the first thing I'll do is I'll write that down in a, in a, a notebook. But after doing, and that's just so I kind of can peg it and, and remember that. But then for the next, however long it takes, that just sits up in my head uh, along with a bunch of other bits and pieces of stories. And um I play with them in my head where, you know, cutting the grass, whatever. And it's the creative process is really taking two things that don't necessarily belong together and putting them together to see if they kind of work. And then once that happens, you, you have to have a story. You know, it can't just be an idea. The story has to have a beginning, middle and end. So that formation in my head may take months. In some cases, it takes years. And as I said, I have a bunch of them up there. It's really easy to erase, which is why they, they stay up there. You know, it's like an Etch-a-Sketch. I just shake my head. Um, but at some point, these, these better, the, you know, the more fully formed ones start knocking on my head like, oh, oh. And when that happens, and it doesn't happen that often, but when that happens, then I start to write it. But I don't go back and type it. I use... I use this for, I actually have something I might be able to even show you. Might be able to, it's almost like storyboards or comic strips. And I have literally hundreds of these. And I will, I will uh, mark out 16 uh, double spreads, which is what most picture books are. And I, in some cases, I'll just write little words in them and start to kind of form the story. And in some cases, if I can't think of the words, I'll draw pictures. I am a visual person. I think in pictures. And so it helps me to have, whether it's a doodle or in some cases I'll paint something to look at to help, you know, kind of write the story. And I'll, I may do that uh, process 30 times until it's finally 
ready to, to show my agent who then will then show it to publishers. So that's kind of, that's my process. Now, do the story ideas come from your childhood or come from your children or come from something you read in the news? How do, where do they come from? It's probably a little all of, uh, all of the, and it, it, I guess it really depends on which story, but for the most part, it's sort of a, a stew of, of my experience as a kid, um, certainly my, my own kids and, and observing them and their friends. And then um, just this thing that I have always had. I, I can remember, I, I spent all my summers up in the Thousand Islands in Ontario on an island that had no television. It had a radio, but I didn't, we didn't, my brothers and I didn't really listen to the radio. So what did I do? I, I read books and comic books. I drew a lot and, and fought with my brothers and scratched mosquito bites. But I, I would come up with these ideas for either a character or a story or whatever. And I'd find myself drawing like just, you know, cities and like all kinds of stuff. I had no idea what I was going to do with it. But I also spent a lot of my time, like when I could get my hands on like the Sunday newspapers, or whatever, cutting out the Sunday comics and pract like practicing drawing those characters and stuff. And so there was something in the back of my head, I think, that I always thought, I want to do that. I, I definitely want to do that. That's why I went to college pre-med. <laughs> now, I, I have to ask you this because one of your recurring subjects of books is a young girl in Ali Soros. How, yeah, does, now, the, how does a middle-aged guy get into the mind of a young girl to write those stories? That, in, in a sense, she was, that, that idea sort of came from my daughter, um, who, as a, you know, just observing her as a four, five, six, whatever year old, she had the most wild imagination. It was pro she probably got it from me, but I was just fascinated how she lived in these. She she loved being a princess and you know that type of, and but she lived it. I mean, she really lived it. I just I just thought that was so crazy or lovely, I should say. But um, there was also a kid in her kindergarten class, or it might have been her preschool. I can't remember now which. But this kid. He was a dinosaur. I mean, he, like, you couldn't talk to him because he would just growl at you and attack you. Um, and so kind of, you know, I sort of put those two things together. And actually, the original version of Allosaurus was going to be about a boy. And uh, that's one of those things where once that idea poked at me enough to write it and I wrote it down, the first time I looked at it, it was going to be called, it was either going to be called Bobzilla or... Something along like Charlie Soros Rex, whatever it was, I read it and I went, all right, this is terrible. So I do what I, I often do, which is I just put it away. And in some cases, I won't look at that for a year. And that's what happened with Ali Soros. And when I did read it again, I just kind of thought of, of my daughter, Heather. And um, I'm like, I'm going to make this a girl who likes pretending that she's a dinosaur. And it basically wrote itself after that. Wow. When you started, who were some of your earliest influences? And can you tell us about how in the heck did you ever meet Charles Schultz? Yeah, he was definitely one of my early influ influences. I go back to what I said about, uh, you know, my summers up on the Thousand Islands. And, and I would, and, and just throughout the year, I would cut, Sunday comics out and figure out how to draw those characters. And by far my favorite character growing up in, in those, especially in those early years was Snoopy. And I loved Snoopy and I, I learned how to draw him. And, and uh, well, my, when I was in third grade, my father worked for an NHL team that no longer exists called the Oakland seals. And we lived out in Oakland, California. And, in art class, I had drawn a horse and it, it was a pretty good horse, I must say, um, for a third grader. I did give it blue eyes, which I don't think horses have blue eyes. <laughs> it looked really good, though. 
But anyways, I was very proud of my horse. And so uh, the SEALs were struggling to get people to go to their games. But one of the people that went to all, he was a season ticket holder of all the Oakland SEALs games was Charles Schultz, the man who drew Snoopy. And my dad, I, like, I don't remember everything about this, but my dad must have told me that because I got it in my head that he needed to see my horse drawing. So With the blue eyes. I, yes, he needed to see my blue-eyed <laughs> stallion. So I, unbeknownst to my dad, uh, when we went to one of the games, and so my dad would always be at work, you know, you know, working during the games, and my brothers and I would be in our seats. Well, I took the horse drawing with me, and I found Charles Schultz's seats, which were right down near the ice, and it's in the middle of the game, and I just, you know, eight-year-old me just walks up to him, and I go, <laughs> hi, uh, I just wanted to show you my horse drawing. <laughs> And I have to say, the nicest kind of, he was just such a nice, uh, hospitable person. Because the play's going on, and, and there's this eight-year-old kid shoving a horse drawing in his face, and he's pretending he's in, impressed by it. And he could not have been nicer. And, like, I, that part, like, at that point, it was kind of a blur. Because the next thing I know, I'm running back up to, to my seats, like sweating, like, whoa, what, did I, what just happened? And like, I, I looked down at my horse drawing and on the back of it, because I think I had asked him for his autograph. I had. He drew Snoopy. So he not only signed his name, but he drew Snoopy. And I, I was like, oh, wow. my God. And it was at that moment, like, that's what I want to do. And I wrote him, you know, my dad, I showed my dad, who was probably not thrilled that I was running around the building, bothering some of the season ticket holders, but um, he gave me his address and I wrote him a thank you note and he wrote me back. And we wrote back and forth a few times at that point. He sent me more uh, sketches and, and things that he had drawn. And then years later, when I sold my first comic strip, I wrote him and told him the story. I go, <laughs> wow. Uh, Sparky, you may not remember this. I'm sure you don't. Uh, but like 20 years ago, you inspired me to, to do this. And I just wanted to let you know that I'm a syndicated cartoonist. And we wrote back and forth ever since that. I sent him with one of my strips. I had a, a line of, of ties with the characters on. I sent him those ties. Um, just to easily, hands down, my hero. Wow. What an influence and yeah. what an incredible story. That you could have ever met your hero. It's oh yeah. It was I, I, almost I have that too. Here is here is oh, that drawing. That oh my gosh. On the back of that is a horse. This looks like the Shroud of Turin. It looks really <laughs> old. But um, and I, I should have it in a better frame. I've dropped this thing now a thousand times showing it to students, but but uh, that to me is that wow. that's the holy grail for me. So Rich. I mean, it sounds like that was an incredible story with Schultz and, you know, the fact that you were able to connect 20 years after that fateful meeting with the blue eyed horse yep. in an arena <laughs> in California. But w was that the moment when you allowed yourself to think, wow, I am a professional illustrator and I'm making a career out of this. Yeah. And, and, it was because it was the point where I had to make the determination as to whether I was going to do that or whether I was going to stay working for the Islanders, which is what I was doing at the time. And it came down. I was, it was mid season. It was December. It was just before Christmas. I had uh, sent my comic strip out to, you know, several syndicates and King features called me and invited me in and said they wanted to buy it. And so I go in kind of talk with them and I get a contract sent to me and I'm like, Oh, I have to make this decision now. You know, am I going to stay with the Islanders? Or am I going to do this? I signed the contract. And so 10 months later, my con my cartoon strip heartland was now running in newspapers around like 180 newspapers around the world. And I'm like, okay, I guess this is what I'm doing. I literally learned by doing because 
I had no experience. I had never done a comic strip before. And, and a lot of people, when they first sell a comic strip, they're in the same boat. You, you kind of, so I made every mistake in the book as I went along, but, but, you know, I, I kind of look at it as going to comic strip school on a scholarship because I was getting paid at the same time. But yeah, I, I would say that that is, that's when I finally kind of went, all right, this is what I'm going to do. And that morphed every, you know, every few years, like when I, I did my second strip or I, I did other things, all of them sort of are under that umbrella of being an author illustrator. So, so Rich, the thing that's kind of cool is you just, you know, reminded me of something that there's not like a, a, a class for comic strips. No. Is there, are you guys like, is there a club for comic strip writers and there, there, well, yeah, there, 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 there is the uh, National Cartoon Society or National uh, Cartoonist Society, but there are also a lot of just local uh, groups on Long Island. There's something called the Burnt Toast Gang, and it's a you know a compilation of many many cartoonists who who uh, get together the last Thursday of every month, and you know they'll meet and eat and drink and tell stories and and stuff like that. I but. It, that just jogged one thing. And it's the thing that probably was the biggest shock of my life. And it, it's when I realized I was a professional. Uh, so my strip aired and my comic strips now running. And I suddenly realized, wow, every single day, one of those comic strips is getting used. So I have to keep coming up with ideas. And then I thought about Charles Schultz again. And at the time he had been doing peanuts for 30 years. I'm like, okay, so 30 years times 365 days a year. I got to do strips for all those days. And oh my word, that's a lot of ideas. And so it, I panicked at the beginning. It's the only time I really had writer's block was at the beginning where I'm like, I can't do, I can't write 30,000 ideas. And what I realized finally was that you don't have to do that at once. You pace yourself. You just, you do your week, you do your next week. You know? So that's, that's kind of when I knew I was a professional. Awesome. It became a job and not just like this hobby. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. Now, you, we, we talked about your dad before. He was the architect of the Islanders for Stanley Cups. And, you know, he's a legend in the game of hockey. He was inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame in 1995. Uh, how does his memory still influence you today? Uh, it, it does. And, I, you know, I, I actually, you know, when you talked about who my – influences were I probably should have put him first because there's and I don't think I realized this at the beginning <clears throat> of my career but as I went along and I reflected upon it and especially after his passing I realized that I watched him and my father was pressured to work on Wall Street like his father and uncle and brother you know all they wanted him to do that and he followed a different path he did his own thing. And not only did he do his own thing, but he, he went through a lot of failure and struggle and disappointment and, um, and yet just kept going uh, to the point where he became, you know, the, the winner of four straight Stanley Cups and a Hall of Famer. Um, and, you know, I, I, I look at that and took a lot of strength in my times of like when things weren't going well, it's like, okay, you, you chose this, you believed, you know, you could do this, you know, it's still there, just keep going. And, and in a sense, follow his model. And the other part of his model, which again, I didn't really know until he passed was he never looked back like every, I, in reflecting upon the cup years, he'd win the cup. And he would spend like a week recuperating and resting and kind of celebrating or whatever. And by and large, after that, he was looking at the next year and moving on. And it's why, like, he never wore a Stanley Cup rings. He was because he was always chasing the next one. And it kept him young. He worked right up until the day he, he passed at 83. So, you know, there, there's a lesson in there. I wanted to switch a little bit, Rich. And, and ask you this, because we're talking about kids in the hospital. Did you or anybody in your family ever experience a time when you were in the hospital? 
Yeah, I um, as a kid, when I was in kindergarten and first grade, I had I had a probably four operations on my ears, maybe more. I I can't really remember at this point. I just know that I was in the hospital quite a few times, uh, at least four times for a week at a clip. And um, it, when you're when you're five and six or whatever, that's that week seems like it's a year. And it's tough. Do you, do you remember what you did to rally yourself to feel better and? to get well and get out of the hospital? Was there I mean, anything special you did? I drew. I, I actually, you know, I can remember playing with plastic army men too, but <laughs> um, but I, I drew a lot. I, I did a lot of drawing and um, that was, you know, I, I took such great pleasure in, in, you know, spending time drawing that that really helped a lot. But we're going to just wrap up. I know you do quite a, a number of public appearances. You read books at schools and at libraries and yep. things like that. Uh, we just want to wrap up with: Is there a particular funny story that you remember from one of your visits with kids that you want to share with us? That just shows hopefully there's another. You're the Charles Schultz to some kid coming along, maybe. I love kids' work too. I mean, they're, they're, to me, there is nothing finer than children's drawing because they're just so pure. Um, but, but in, in some of the cases where they become the art critic, and they'll they'll actually start critiquing my work, and which I I love just as much. They're like that that really doesn't look like a dog, or that doesn't really look like it. But there's another one that just popped in my head. It's not a kid, but um, I did a, a tour one year where I went around to department stores and signed the neckties that had some of my characters on it. And I was out in California at, at a department store and people had waited in line to have me draw something or sign their tie or whatever. And there was a guy, I don't know how long he waited, but he definitely waited for a while. He comes up to me and he had a, a piece of cardboard or something for me to draw on. He goes, can you draw me someone swimming with a sandwich <laughs> and I, I like what that was the oddest thing that anyone has ever said or requested from me and it stuck with me it's been 20 years but I still remember the guy who waited in line to have me draw somebody swimming with a sandwich <laughs> oh, Rich I, I it's been delightful to spend some time with you today I am sure that all of the patients who get to hear you are going to be inspired by your story, how you oh, that's, hung in that's there, you, you had an idea, and, you know, hopefully there's a kid out there drawing a blue-eyed pony who gets inspired the way that you were when you were eight years old and, and goes on to get well and to lead a happy life. Yes. That, is brought to you by doing something you love, which you clearly do. So, yep, thanks, absolutely. Thank, thank you, Rich. Oh, thank you. I, it was my pleasure. Thank you.